Welcome to the Coast Podcast. I'm Emily, a virtual assistant agency owner who left Amazon in 2019 to build my dream. And I'm Whitney, a freelance writer and communications consultant who never felt at home in a cube farm. We didn't see many people paving their own ways like we decided to, so we created this podcast to talk to others who were brave enough to pick a different path. Creatives, entrepreneurs, people doing their careers and their lives their way. Join us as we learn from them, get inspired, and show you beautiful paths less traveled. Not every road leads to the coast, but the ones that do come with a great view. Hey everyone, welcome back to the coast. I'm Whitney Popa, a communications consultant in Edmonds, Washington. And I'm Emily Given, a virtual assistant agency owner in Linwood, Washington. And today we have the super exciting pleasure of introducing Kinsey Fields, who is a doula holistic wellness coach and podcast host of A Better Knowing. Kinsey, thank you so much for being here today. We're so happy to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, I'm thrilled to be here. So if you don't know this, which you don't because we haven't told you yet, um, Kinsey and I go way, 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 way back. So I think we met, I was a junior and you were a sophomore probably in high school. And we actually cheered together on our cheer squad. And um, yeah, so we've known each other for a long time and we've both come a long way since then. And I mean, this is like, I mean, you can talk about your background. We would love to hear your background, but like you're now in birth work and holistic wellness and, um, you know, drinking rock stars out of the back of someone's pickup from high school. Like you wouldn't think that <laughs> about either of us that were in like these different industries. I mean, rock stars are fine, but like we really drink a lot of them and eat Taco Bell every single day before cheer practice. So I think by rock star, you mean four logos. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Mm, I just wasn't going like to out myself story. like that, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, all the talk about, and we're like, cause pretty sure rock star, I know you're not that much younger than me, but like rock star was not a thing. Oh, it was a thing for us. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. I think yeah. there were people in our high school that were sponsored by rock star. <laughs> like right? actually, I'm thinking we won't name names. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Kinsey, thank you so much for being here. Tell us a little bit more about, I mean, a lot more. Tell us a lot more about A Better Knowing and what you do now and who you work with and tell us all the things. Okay, you got it. So I think that what would be really helpful is if um, the listeners, the audience knew kind of my background really quickly. And if I start on a tangent, you guys reel me back in because I do have a tendency. Um, my background is in education. I was a former, I'm a former elementary school teacher. And that was the only thing I ever wanted to do <laughs> um, at, since a childhood. And I graduated high school when I was 17 and went on this path of becoming a teacher. And, um, you know, you just kind of go on your path that you think you're called to be. And then as you evolve, you kind of learn really where you're meant to go. Right. And so I taught in Seattle, and, well, in Edmonds, <laughs> I always say Seattle because I'm in Virginia. And so if you say Washington out here, they think Washington, DC. Anyway, um, we taught in Edmonds, um, and Everett for four years. And in 2018, we got pregnant and married and had our daughter in, um, in Bellevue. And then one month later we moved to Virginia and then I stayed home for three years. So I'm trying to give you the short version, but I basically, I taught and then I had babies and was home for three years. And then I went back to teaching last year, which was supposed to be kind of the first, you know, normal, I'm using air quotes, normal year post pandemic in education and educators had been through a lot. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not going to go into all of the nuts and bolts of that, but I mean, if you lived in the United States, you know, all of the things, right? Not just pandemic here. Am I talking about? Um, so I went back last year and, um, we had put both of our daughters in daycare and, 
Um, so I had a six month old and a three year old and I was gone for 10 plus hours a day and my kids were in daycare forever. We were all sick all of the time and stress And I'll say this, I'll say this later on too, stress is a silent killer. And I could just immediately by November of, of that first year returning, which was 21, 22 school year, I was like, this is not it. (laughs) Like, I don't know what it is, but this is definitely not it. Like I was made for more than to just shuffle my babies out the door at 6.30 a.m. and rush home by 5 p.m., make dinner, do bedtime, and wake up and do it all over again. And it was just so incredibly hard on all of us, right? It wasn't just – it was no longer just about me. It was about my whole family. And so I remember one day I was – uh, listening to a podcast that I listened to f- for many years and they were doing a webinar on, um, health coaches. And I was like, you know what, I'm just going to explore it. Right. And in, and literally in desperation, I was like, I have to come up with a different plan for how to get out of this. It's like, I just can't do this anymore. Um, hopped on this webinar, listened to it. And that literally just changed the trajectory of my life. Right. Um, and I, I think that we all often share like that turning point, like as an aha, and then everything changed, but it it took so much time, right? Like it wasn't just like overnight, I've arrived here where I am now. Um, And then to back up a little bit more, um, 2021, January of 21 is when I had my daughter, my second daughter um, in a birth center with a doula. My first daughter was born, as I mentioned, in Bellevue, Washington, and it was a very traumatic birth. So, and I'll talk about this a little bit more too, but the long short of it is that with my second birth, it was very healing and I had a doula and that's how I fell in love with the work that doulas do because she was just literally a godsend to me. And, um, I'm still really good friends with her to this day. And I just, I'm so grateful for that experience because it was another catalyst of my life, right? So I did immediately do my coursework to become a doula, but at that time, I mean, my daughter at that time was like four or five months old. Like it wasn't reasonable for me to go and just like try out this new thing, right? We wanted to buy a house. We had like real life things that we needed to um, accomplish and that required real life money. <laughs> so that's kind of what got me back into teaching. Um, I was excited, but I was apprehensive, um, just because I knew I was going to be walking into uncertain territory. Right. And so, um, that year was like one of the most life-changing and challenging years of my life. That, that first year back with my girls in daycare and going to work and just being it, exceptionally burnt out on a level I never knew before. Um, and there is so much, there's so much heartbreak in our schools right now. There is so much pain in our society. And, um, I just, I couldn't be the mother that I wanted to be, um, or the person by just being on this hamster wheel. So, you know, I did my coursework. I basically went back to school to be a holistic coach and, um, had to step away at different times because, you know, it's it's basically like going back to college and, um, the summer came. And at that point I had started dueling with my birth center and, um, had been to a few births and was like starting to feel it out and like get a rhythm for it. And summer came and I was like, okay, like, I think this is enough reprieve. Like, I think I can go through it and get back to teaching and like do it another year and make a decision then. Right. I was like, I can, I can do this. Um, it was probably the most rocky school year I've ever experienced this, the start of the school year. Um, I know, I know out of respect for my school and my, my, obviously my kids and like my student kids and their families and everything, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but it was just, it was, um, I'm at a loss for words. Like it, what I was seeing was just heartbreaking and I could, I could not keep doing it. I mean, we had children that were suffering from like trauma, like real trauma, you know, and big T and little T trauma, if you know what I mean. Um, do. <laughs> so you put enough of those kids in one space and, and not only that, but the, the staff were hurting. The staff are 
burnt out and they're exhausted and they love these kids so much. We That's the thing about teachers is like we would do anything for these kids, right? But there was just enough gut feelings really and like little indicators like you can't keep doing this, right? And so um, by six weeks into the school year, we made the decision that I would resign and I would focus solely on being a doula and launching my holistic wellness um, coaching practice. Can I ask you a question right here? Because this mm-hmm. is something that's really important for budding entrepreneurs. Talk talk to me about the we made the decision part because mm-hmm. a lot of people um, have a lot of hesitation or they don't have spousal support or like they mm-hmm. – so talk to me about your we and your support for a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, great question. So I am not going to fake it. Like I have a unicorn husband that literally supports me and believes in everything that I do. Um, and so he was a big, you know, if he trusted and believed in me, then that did give me the confidence to go in, into this. But it's it was messy. I mean, like it still is messy, right? Like I'm still a budding, you know, business owner and figuring all this stuff out. And you don't know what you don't know. And so you just kind of do one step at a time. And there's days that feel like a fire hydrant is in your face of like information and things you need to do. And then there's days that you feel like, oh, I got a rhythm going. Um, But for us, it was looking at um, obviously finances, like just on a logistical scale. It was looking at finances. It was figuring out, it was like talking to my HR and figuring out like, okay, when do paychecks end, Um, talking to my admin, um, so like my boss. And figuring out like, you know, do you guys – My I had a lot of support for my school, actually. I'm going to be honest. Like they were incredible. I love them. I left on great terms. Um, I wish I could have stayed and, and done that, but I, I couldn't and they understood that. And so I basically structured it so that I used out all of my um, PTO or like my leave. And that gave me a little bit of a runway um, and teachers – just, I don't know if this is helpful or not, but teachers get paid once a month. That's pretty standard. And so I knew that I was going to have like a full month salary still coming for, so I had like a little bit of a cushion. And so I used my time off and I used that time to make a really beautiful exit. You know, I um, wrote all of the sub plans, shared all my resources, got everything organized and like, you know, like logistically my ducks in a row. And, um, did all of the like paperwork and things like that. And then we just kind of dove into it. And we did have um, a little bit of a cushion because my girls were still in daycare. And I mean, I'm not going to go into like all of the finances behind it, but we had um, done some financial moves in the summer that in hindsight, I feel like we knew this was going to happen in a weird way. Like we didn't know we were planning for this, if that makes sense. But it very much worked out that way. Like we thought we were planning for to cover the cost of daycare for the year. Right. right? But the and universe actually, knew. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it was like, oh, this is actually what we were supposed to be doing. This is why we made that decision. Right. And at the time we didn't connect the dots. Um, so then I dove into that and I was doing, you know, a lot of doula clients. And um, so I had that component too, right? Like I still had income because I had started being a doula last, the the spring before I left. And so I'm very blessed in that regard um, because I had a support team with my birth center, right? And they were very supportive of me and like people that I could talk to about all of that. Um, And then through um, the Institute of Transformational Nutrition, where I got my certification, there's a lot of support there as well. And I had like a... um, business coach that I could schedule with and things like that. Does that answer your question, Emily? Yes. Yes. I just want, I just like to hear people's story of, Mm -hmm. you know, the support that they received and like everyone's support looks different and everyone's journey Mm -hmm. looks different. And so we really try to highlight that, especially on the Mm -hmm. show um, Mm -hmm. because everyone's in a different situation. So yeah. yeah, it's really important too. And just to speak to that a little bit more, I think that a lot of times we hear a lot of entrepreneurial shows and stuff that are like giving you that confidence to do it, to do that thing. And then you do that thing and you're like, okay, but how did they do this? You know what I mean? So I love that you wanted to bring that up because everybody's situation is different. And if you are getting a lot of 
business or entrepreneurial advice from people that you don't see yourself in. Like I got a lot of advice, for, you know, learned a lot from men, men that don't have small kids. And I'm like, okay, I need to like hone in on how women with small children are figuring this out, right? Because it's, it's possible. Um, so I think that's really, I love that you brought that up. Okay. So I always like to break this down and assume that people don't know what a doula is, like don't know anything. So break this down and explain it to like Whitney would say, like, like you're talking to your grandma, right? Yes. But I I always like to couch that in like, my grandma's not stupid. She's just very, very curious because the way that I can present her is like, my grandma wants to know everything and she's going to ask you like a million questions, but you really do have to start at the beginning because she doesn't understand anything that's not getting paid to be a teacher, a doctor, or a lawyer. That's like her generation. Absolutely. And great question. And just a little side story. I was just thinking about a conversation I had with my grandma who obviously knew nothing about what a doula is and then was so mind blown by the birth, um, by water birth (laughs) that I got to do like a little education with her on it. And she's just from this little tiny town in Kentucky. So this was just like mind blowing. And I loved that I got to share that with her. So what is a doula? What does a doula do? And I also think that this translates into what is a holistic wellness coach. They're very, very similar. In fact, um, I have found more similarities than not. I think that a holistic wellness coach is sort of like a life doula. And so what does that mean? Um, I kind of describe a doula in a couple of different ways. Number one, it's sort of a, um, like a conscious person when you're having this out of body experience, right? They're your like thinking brain while you are just in labor land. And, um, the other way you can think about a doula is like your birth bestie. Like it's this person that you meet and you build this relationship and trust with, and then they're going to help you look out for your best interests and navigate this, um, wherever you're choosing to birth. Um, so I'll get into kind of like specifics of what a doula is in a minute, but I do want to clarify one misconception that I think a lot of people have about doulas is that they only support women that are wanting like natural out of hospital births. And that's really not true. Um, I go to plenty of hospital births. I support plenty of women with all different varieties of birth needs, but really the, the core of a doula is that she is there to give you help you have the experience that you want to have. And I will say just from my own personal experience, I did not have a doula with my first. I was like, we got this. Like we took hypnobirthing classes together. My husband and I are like super tight, really like we've known each other as well since high school. And, um, and we felt prepared to have the birth experience that we wanted to have. And, you know, it's, it's the thing where you don't know what you don't know. Right. And we did not know how unprepared we were to to navigate that. And so a doula is somebody that can really help you understand the ins and outs of, um, of birth number one. And then like wherever you're birthing at, it's really important. Um, especially in the hospital setting, I will say, because, um, there is something called a cascade of interventions and that's what I experienced. Um, now I will also say that there is absolutely a time and place for medical intervention. And also if you choose to have an epidural or something along those lines, totally valid. What I care about as a doula is that you have the experience that you want and that you feel empowered and supported and educated, right? And so that looks like a lot of different things. That's very similar to what I do as a holistic coach, right? I'm kind of that middle person between the healthcare system and like mental health care professionals and doctors and things like that. And somebody that can help you and take that information, sift it down into what you really need and what your goals are, right? Both jobs, whoops, both jobs are aligned with your goals. So this is not um, a doula. You're not hiring a doula so that you can have the birth experience that they want. It's so that you can have the birth experience you want. So logistically, what does a doula do? Um, they offer in the, in the prenatal, right? So when you're pregnant, they're going to offer education. They're going to talk to you about your birth preferences. Um, what do you, what are your goals? What do you want to get out of your birth experience? Birth is transformational. And what I always tell people is to reframe birth, that it's not that birth is scary and painful. It's that women are powerful and strong. And when we have the right support, you can have this transformational, transformative experience 
when you are supported. This is literally how we were designed to birth, right? Like in tribes and communities and small cultures with women. And so I'm not going to go into like the whole history of birth, but like there is very much a need for women to be supported through this, through this journey. Um, so in the prenatal, it's education, it's, um, you know, talking through their goals. Then when it comes time for birth, Obviously, that's going to look very different depending on what your birth plan is, but they can do things like um, physical comfort measures, so like hip squeezes, counter pressure, um, doing certain different labor positions. They're making sure that you're eating and hydrating and, you know, they're affirming your fears and helping you move through like the mental thing. Birth is largely, in my opinion, mental. It's like you're in your head so much and when you can really drop out of your head your thinking space and drop into just this... I don't know, this other dimension really of like just trusting your body and having peace, then you can birth the way that you want. But if any fear enters in and you don't have somebody to mirror back that you're safe and you're taken care of, then you're, you know, it's a dangerous slippery slope to be on, right? Um, and then postpartum, they're just like there to help you navigate, um, talk about your birth experience, decompress things. Um, it doesn't always, just because you have a doula does not mean that you're always going to have this beautiful picture perfect birth like you get out what you put into it and then sometimes crazy things happen and it is really nice to have that one person that was with you through it all that can debrief and kind of walk you through and help you make sense of some things I just realized that I needed a doula in my second birth especially because my I didn't do any drugs I was in the hospital I said, I told myself, if I show up at nine again, centimeters dilated, then I will go all the way with this one because I think having the epidural and having to be on my back kind of affected that I had to push for four hours with my son. Also, first birth and all of that. I'm sure you know a lot more than I do, but I, you just unlock something for me in the fact of like, I had always said, I don't want a doula because I don't want to pay somebody. And we talked a little bit about this before we started recording. I don't want to pay somebody to touch me when I don't even want to be touched. Like, I just need to be, like, in the zone and also be, like, left alone. Like, I don't know how to, like, navigate those two things. But when I had um, our daughter and she came out and she had inhaled fluid on the way out, so they immediately took her away from me. I was in the room alone with just a sheet over me in my own bloody birth mess and the nurse was just sitting there doing notes nobody told me anything nobody was giving me updates my husband left to be with her when they took her up to the NICU I knew nothing I had no phone signal and it was really brutally traumatizing to be left alone in my own filth and and like no sheet barely even covering me and have so many unanswered questions and zero support. Like I kind of thought the midwives and the nurse would be there to provide some of that and they were not. So um, that's just a statement and an unlock for me. I'm not going to have any more kids, but if I were to, I would absolutely have a doula the next time just for that postpartum support alone. And I'm wondering too, like how you work with the on-site team if somebody I had midwives with me, the doctor, whomever, like, you know them in advance, you're, do you come to appointments so that they know what's the kind of protocol or role that you have there in um, getting to know the team so that they don't have their weird, especially for doctors, I had like an egomaniacal Nick you doctor who was like such an asshole, but um, is that ever weird or awkward in navigating like those other support team members. So much to unpack there. First of all, I just want to like really validate your experience because I, um, I think that this, this kind of thing happens a lot to women and, um, it's similar in the birth world and in just like the health model in general. And I'm not somebody that bashes Western medicine, but I am somebody that wants us to like be a little bit more knowledgeable going into these things because, I, again, we don't know what we don't know, right? So in your experience, your doctors and nursing staff and everybody believed they were doing their job. They were doing what they were supposed to do, get the baby safe, right? That's You'll hear this over and over again. As well, as long as mom and baby are safe, that's all that matters. Wrong, in my opinion. I hate that. I hate it when people say that. It's so triggering. I'm like, 
safe? What do you mean safe? Not safe in my mm-hmm. head. Come on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's very triggering. It's very gaslighting because it totally diminishes what your goals were and what you were hoping to become um, or hoping to have out of that experience. And I think women in particular are especially susceptible to this. And again, speaking on in the whole medical model, right? How many women, because again, in my holistic coaching practice, like I'm a hormone specialist, how many women go to the doctor for X, Y, and Z symptoms only to be told, oh, you're just, you know, this or that. It's, you know, this is normal. It's not normal, right? These things are not normal. And to go back to your birth experience with my daughter, with my first daughter, I remember being strapped into the operating room. I, you know, my I'm shaking, convulsing, and they're pulling her out of me. And I didn't even know she was born yet. Nobody said anything to me. Same. And nobody. And it's just her. I had, I remember asking, is she out yet? And they were like, oh, yeah, she's fine. She, and I'm like, cool. Can somebody tell me this? No, you know? EJ didn't so, even cry. And I'm like, is he okay? Is he alive? Yeah. And nobody fucking answered me. Like, it's, yeah. Just, yeah. It's, being alone and not knowing what the hell's going on mm-hmm. is so, it's mm-hmm. so awful. It's an awful feeling. And, um, I have also been on transfers or in hospital scenarios where like y- you shared Whitney with where somebody had to go with baby. Right. And mom is just like, world is rocked. Like this human that you just grew and bonded with is now outside of your womb and gone. And that is absolute trauma. Oh 100%. God. It's the worst thing ever. And we just don't have a lot of things in place for that. Right. What's interesting is that, and I believe you both had babies in the NICU. Is mm-hmm. that correct? You just gave birth, and these NICU units are oftentimes not conducive to a woman that just gave birth, right? There's like a chair for you to sit in, and like you just had birth to human. EJ was at like a NICU in a different city than I was at. So it was like, yeah. So you're in and out of the car yeah. multiple times. Well, I didn't get Your a body's go. body's trying to heal. But yeah. Yeah. But. Yeah, it's – yeah, no no good. No, <laughs> It's awful. It is awful. And, you know, I think that they – for the most part, I think they have the best of intentions. But, again, I know too much now to, like, blindly trust that. And I hate to say that. But um, so to go back to your question about, like, what is it like being in the hospital setting as a doula? And um, it really depends on where you're at. It depends on if – the staff want you there or not (laughs) depends on what their views are on what your client wants you know um it can either be an amazing experience I mean I was at a planned cesarean for one of my clients um and I got to be in the OR with them and the doctor was just absolutely like what kind of music do you want to listen to it's your baby's birthday like it's it was beautiful and so healing for me (laughs) as a side note to be in such a beautiful cesarean birth. But, um, I've also been at a birth, a hospital birth where my client rolled up nine centimeters about to push her baby out. And the amount of feedback she was getting from the team that was just like, not supportive of where she was at was like, it, I'm going to be honest. It really makes me evaluate my time in the hospitals. Like I, I believe every woman deserves to have access to birth resources Um, specifically doulas. I think a lot of people like Whitney and myself, I didn't think I needed a doula until I needed one. And then I was like, oh, this is why. Um, And so it really varies. I would say for the most part, they are supportive, but not always. And I think what's harder too is like seeing sometimes like your clients be berated for what they want or just not heard. Right. And so A great example of a doula in the hospital setting um, is – so a doula cannot speak on your behalf. I cannot tell the medical doctors, don't do this. She doesn't want an epidural. She doesn't want an episiotomy. Like she doesn't want Pitocin, whatever. But what I can tell you, the client, is, hey, I'm seeing that the doctors are prepping X, Y, and Z. Do you want to ask them if you want to have some time to, you know, think about things before, or maybe you were presented some information, right? Or maybe we're just picking up on, hmm, this doctor is headed for a section, right? Like that's where their head is at. So I can speak to my client or speak to my client's partner, birth team, uh, like her family or whatever. Hey guys, um, do you guys want a couple minutes to think this over? And like, maybe we can all talk privately about what's going on so you can make an informed decision. 
Um, informed consent is is like very rarely a thing. Totally, we, they say it's informed. Con- it, they say it's informed consent. It's 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 not even possible sometimes. Like when you are handing a woman who is ten centimeters dilated about to push a baby out, and you have to have her sign these forms. There's literally no way she can make an informed decision at that time. I had no idea what I was signing. I was like being like rushed on a stretcher and shaking and my pulse was like 180 or something insane shaking. And they're like, sign this form. And I'm like signing. I have no idea what I signed. No idea. No idea. Um, And then, you know, it's also like you might have a birth plan. They may or may not care about it. You know, and again, I don't think that these doctors are malicious or anything like that. I mean, there are some out there that are that are dangerous, but for the most part, like they got into this work for a reason, right? But unfortunately, it's turned into something that birth is not, and it's you know, I'm choosing my words as carefully as I can, but it's a time thing too. It's like get them out, get oh, them in, get them out, turn it over, hundred percent, yeah, one hundred. I mean, there's so many things. The thing is about hospital births is that they are trained to intervene. That is literally their training about birth, right? So when you're in – and and that's not to say that all birth centers are created equal either or that home birth is for everybody. I'm not saying that. There is absolutely a time and place it has to be what you want. However, the caveat to that is that hospital staff are trained to intervene. They're watching – it's it's the idea that if you go looking for trouble, you're going to find it, right? There are a lot of correlations between a lot of different things and cesarean rates or low APGAR scores or whatever, right? Um, and I mean, I could talk about this for hours, but I just think that's where a doula or a birth professional outside of that's not invested in – they're invested in your experience. They're not getting paid – to have X number of clients uh, or X number of births in their hospital and like turnover beds or they're not on a time, like they're getting paid, you're paying them. But likewise, I always try to encourage my, my clients too, that like, even though we don't view it this way, your birth staff is you're, you're hiring them. So if you don't feel safe, you need to choose somebody else. If you don't feel like you're being heard, you need to choose somebody else. Induction rates are, astronomical in our country. The United States is one of the least safest places to birth, if not the least safe place to birth in the developed world. Why is that? Why do we have all the money invested in healthcare and we are one of the sickest nations? It literally doesn't make sense. Because we have a sick care system. You're like getting me all like fired up about all these things that Mm -hmm. I care about with um, our healthcare and sick care system. And I just, I'm so excited about the work that you're doing because it's so helpful for so many. Did you see, I think it was in Vogue a couple months ago, they did a whole profile. It was Vogue, Marie Claire, Elle magazine, because those are the ones that I subscribe to. They had this big article about a Hollywood doula. She's a woman who grew up in Malibu and she's like the daughter of some big school like director guy and she there's like a movement in the celeb world of more and more people using people like her and what was so cool for them is that she understood their lifestyle and was able to advocate for them from a place of like this is a very fabulous like you know well-positioned person and I'm coming in here to be this magical birth fairy and she's really like changing the landscape in like LA celebrity Hollywood scene of these births that are more for the mom than they are for the hospital. And I'm, I mentioned that because I'm so excited to see like more visibility for it because even I, as a person who's a crunchy, fancy hippie, I didn't see how it would help me and talking to you and learning about her. I'm just like, if every woman could sit for a minute with herself and really figure out what she needs and not just blindly follow medical advice that may be well-intentioned, then we would have such a better outcome for so many people. 
Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing I wanted to kind of connect to is that our healthcare system, birth, like my wor work that I do in the birth world, and our education system all have so many parallels. And that was largely the reason I got out of education because I couldn't ignore this stuff anymore. Right. And so as a doula, I feel like, okay, well, at least I can make a difference in my client's life. And the other thing is like, I have, <clears throat> excuse me, I have such a massive heart for people. Like my gift genuinely is connection. I can find connection with almost any person. And that was so overwhelming growing up because that meant I felt extremely deeply, right? Like I am very clearly an empath, but I very clearly did not um, identify with that. I resisted that because I was like, no, empaths are just people that don't have very good boundaries. <laughs> like, so sorry for anybody that identifies that way, but that's very much how I felt. Like I was like, if I can just get my boundaries clear, like work on myself, I can kind of like work out all of this other feeling stuff, like this intense feeling. When I became a doula, I, I genuinely for the first time really stepped into that power and like understood. It was actually back in November and December recently um, where I went through some really crazy experiences with some clients um, and literally like felt the energetic change um, like on a cellular level after working with them. Um, because I hold that space like with so much sacredness. And I guess I say all of that because I really want people to feel like my whole mission, right? My mission is that I want women to feel, um, empowered and to reclaim their vitality and their energy and their peace and, and their autonomy over their bodies, right? Because we have been conditioned to not trust ourselves. We've been conditioned not to trust our bodies and not listen to our own needs. And that's a re really dangerous place to be as a, as a society. Um, and likewise, we do that with children, right? Our kids are crying out for help in the education world and our hands are just tied our hands are tied and it is exhausting to know that these kids and families, right? It's, it's about people. Like, I know we talk about these big entities and like, you know, um, the healthcare system is a massive player and big pharma is a massive player. And like all in the food ag industry is a massive player. Right. But at the heart of it all is human beings. And I am just, I'm finally in alignment with the work that I can do on that level. Like I, I always tell people like, we can't, you know, we can't wave a magic wand, right. And like, poof, the world is healed, but you can heal yourself. And that is a radical way to show up in the world, to heal the, to help the world heal. Right? Because you're We're creating all... a ripple. We're creating a ripple. Exactly. Exactly. And so I felt like I had a bigger mission to serve. I really had this like gut visceral feeling that like, <sighs> I had to get out of the classroom because I couldn't do, I couldn't make the impact that I needed to make. I mean, did I make an impact in, in my kids' lives? Absolutely. I still, to this day, excuse me, um, talk to many of my families. I'm still in many, in contact with many of my former students, right? And their parents and stuff. I love them. I love every single child that came into my classroom on like a deep, real level. Because what I was gifted in was, again, the relationship piece. I saw these kids come in and I'm like, man, I know what it's like, right? I see you. I see why you're acting this way. I see why you're struggling with this. And yet my hands were tied because I was in a failing system, right? And I couldn't do it anymore. And so that's really where, you know, I was like, I have to revision how I can show up in the world and how I can like live my truth and live in alignment with what I feel I was put here on the earth to do. And and that's not an, uh, I know that sounds kind of like grandiose or like full of myself. That's not it at all. Like I just, I needed a way to use my gifts in a meaningful way that could impact other people. And so by having a podcast, by having, um, you know, by becoming a doula and by becoming a holistic coach, it's like, I can work one-on-one -on -one with people, but guess what? They are then sharing that information and that translates over into their relationships and into their lives with their children and their spouses and their friends. And Again, when you heal yourself, you heal the world. That's literally how we do it, right? Every great leader, every great thought leader, every great person that, you know, the people that we think of that changed the world, it was because they saw 
individuals, as human beings that needed love and needed to be seen. And they served like they lived a life of service. And so I get really worked up about that because I just, (laughs) I obviously love people so much. And, um, you know, that's why I take so much responsibility in like doing my own work, right? Like working on myself and showing up for myself because I am a mother and goodness gracious is parenting like the, the rawest mirror of life that we will ever see <laughs> as far as like, Hey, here's all the stuff you need to work on and resolve. Right. Oh my gosh. And isn't so- it like seeing your kids? <laughs> At the age you were when you Mm. even experienced any sort of trauma, you're like, oh my Mm -hmm. God, let me do this completely Mm. differently. It is, Mm -hmm. it is a crazy mirror. You're so right. It is. And recently, like very recently in the last few weeks, I realized that like my desire, my trajectory that I went on to become a teacher largely stemmed from my childhood trauma, (laughs) right? That's why I was going to be a good girl and like just fit in and do these things. And I talked about that in a podcast episode I made. And I I just think I want to bring awareness, right? I want us to know ourselves deeply and trust ourselves and trust that when you have a voice that's saying this isn't right, something's not right, we need to listen to that. We need to honor that. Yeah. Um, Going back to your comment earlier about firing your team, I love that you use that empowered language because that's something I did with my first OB. And I, I'm getting, I'm slowly getting back on TikTok, but when one of my first like viral videos on TikTok was talking about firing my OB and choosing or choosing midwives instead and why I did. And I got, you know, there's always trolls there. So they were like, man, why you use that language of firing? It's so harsh. I'm like, for me, in order to take my power back for a lot of things, I use that language all the time. I say it fired my clients. I fired my OB. Our time is our most precious resource. And I have one body, one life. So to be in a place where I was uncomfortable, this woman was just, I'm not even going to get into how awful this woman was, but I had called the next day and I had a really great place that asked me if I would be open to midwives. And I was uneducated about whether they would give me an epidural because that's what I wanted that first time. And when they said that not only do you get more time with each person and that you know these people because you have a team of them, you know who's going to be at your birth because you've met them all, not just who's on call. I was like, sign me up. So I feel like with all my births, I kept learning more. All my births, my two births. I learned more along the way. If I were to ever do it again, I would probably be at home in the water with a doula. But I love that you use that language in empowering your clients because, like you said, so many women are so gaslit in our own health experience. And I'd love to hear more about, like, your health coaching beyond the doula world because I find that we're in this really cool movement. I want us to push it even further of, like, people taking their health back into their own hands and really educating themselves and having the right team around them coaching and supporting them. So I'm really excited about what you're doing for women in birth and then beyond. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I think that my, uh, you know, my, my motivation for getting into this world and, and I guess, first of all, to just acknowledge that, like what you're saying, these people are working for you. Right. And I think that we have a lot of stipulations with insurance companies and, um, you know, money is a real factor. And so not everybody has the luxury of like going out and interviewing and, you know, finding all these people. And I do also want to just throw this little nugget out there that midwives and OBs and there's different types of midwives. There's, um, CPMs, which are certified professional midwives. And then there's, um, CN, CNMs, which are nurse midwives. And I don't know if I got that second acronym correct, but, um, whatever title anybody holds does not indicate their level of care for you, right? You could have, there are amazing OBs out there that do incredible work and honor them. There are midwives out there that do harm, you know, just like they're, so we have to use discernment in what lens you're looking through and like what kind of questions you're asking. And again, coming back to what is it that you want, right? Um, But to go into like the holistic wellness coaching and like how I got involved in that, Um, I always describe it again, like I mentioned earlier, as it's kind of a middle person between the doctors 
and a, a mental health professional and then you're like leaving with this information you don't really know what to do with, right? Um, a lot of people don't realize that doctors um, are contracted with insurance companies and other um, players at will to have to meet a certain quota of people in a certain amount of time. So I think the average time that a doctor is like contracted to see their clients is like seven minutes or something like that. Like that's what they literally have to be in and out. That is part of their contract. Okay. So people need to understand that first and foremost. That's why the nurse comes in ahead of time and does all your vitals and gets the lay of the land. And then the doctor comes in for a second and, you know, does whatever they're doing. So my history with health, um, in a nutshell, back when I was 20 years old, I was on a bunch of different medications because every time I'd go to the doctor, I'd get a different medication and nobody was ever, you know, figuring out why is this healthy 20 year old, um, expressing all of these symptoms, right? And then you'd get a different med that would cause another symptom and you're just on this vicious cycle. And I mean, I, I literally thought I was going to die. I was having panic attacks multiple times a day. I couldn't barely move my fingers and joints. Um, I was having like heart palpitations. I was losing weight. I was not trying to lose weight. I, I'm going to like rheumatologists and, you know, I'm getting all this lab work done. And I'm thinking, is this arthritis? Is this cancer? Is this lupus? Like, I, I have no idea what's going on and I can't make any sense of it. And the short version of this is that one of my good friends at the time had taken some of my medication because she was dealing with addiction. And that day I realized, I don't know what the heck this is, but this is dangerous and I don't want to be a part of it. And I don't recommend this at all. I'm not, uh, this is my massive like red light medical disclaimer. But for me, what I intuitively did was I got rid of all my meds and I went cold Turkey and I was like, I'm starting from scratch. Like screw this. I was 12 years old when I was diagnosed with depression. Do you know the mental health um, rates of children and the suicide rates of children is skyrocketing? The health rates of children are skyrocketing right now, like more and more just disease. It's heartbreaking what's happening in our in our world and in our culture. And um, and so at 12 years old, I got diagnosed with depression, and that kind of you know then I had. Um, really painful periods. And so I was put on birth control, at like 12, 13 years old. I was given literally narcotics to cope with my cramps. And, um, I mean, it just grew like that. Right. Until I was like, I lit, I can't do this anymore. Like I'm dying. I'm dying. My body is shutting down. So I did that. Um, again, don't recommend that, but that's what I did. And I did never look back from there. I was like, I'm done. I can't, I'm going to, white knuckle it through and learn as much as I can. Um, got through it. Um, still always kind of struggled with depression and anxiety on and off at different times, big time struggled with postpartum depression with my first and birth trauma. I mean, hello, um, leaving my job and moving to a different state probably didn't help either, (laughs) but, um, yeah, it was just, it was a whirlwind. Right. And so then with my second daughter, I think this was really like the second wave of um, coming into this. My With my second daughter, I was like, I'm having a healing birth. And I don't think people associate healing and birth. I don't think they really like connect those words together very often. But I was like, I'm having a healing birth. We got pregnant in 2020. The world was doing what the world was doing. And there was just massive tension everywhere. And so I cocooned. I like got off social media. I stopped talking to like anybody that wasn't immediate. And I was just like, I'm focusing on growing this human and having a healing birth. I was still nursing my daughter at the time, my oldest, she was almost two and I was extremely sick. I was also vegan at the time and my body was just like, okay, lady, like you're growing a human, you're nursing a human, you're, you know, seriously depleted in nutrients. And I can talk about that another time. But, um, I got really, really sick and I called my midwives and I was like, look, I'm, I'm like borderline feeling like I don't even deserve to live anymore because I am so like depleted. Right. And I had such bad anxiety and it was 2020 and I just had this overwhelming feeling of like, what the hell am I doing bringing a human into this world right now? Like, oh my gosh, you can barely take care of yourself. Right. I don't know if anybody has been there before, but it's like, it's a very scary place to be. And so I called them and I was like, look, I don't know what's going on, but I need help. And literally one phone call, she was like, okay, do this, 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 and this until we can run some labs 
and then we're going to look at your labs and go from there, right? That was probably the first time anybody in the healthcare world took me seriously and said, okay, this is what we're going to do. So I started an iron supplement that was really bioavailable, started taking vitamin D. Um, she told me about lemon balm and motherwort, which are herbal remedies for anxiety and depression and St. John's wort. Um, that's when I started using tinctures regularly and I learned about nutrition and it was really difficult for me because the, and they never, um, said like, you need to start eating meat again, but she did emphasize protein. And, um, as soon as I started eating protein and change, making these little tweaks, eating animal protein again, um, I immediately felt better. Like within days I'm talking, like I immediately felt better. And it was just this wide eyed, like, holy cow, this is what, um, <laughs> this is what nutrition and plant medicine and, you know, all of these things can do right for us. They can literally heal us. They can heal, heal our bodies. And, um, I went on to have this incredible healing birth. And and it's funny because my doula, um, she was such an, a key player in that, but in the grand scheme of things, she really didn't touch me that much, Whitney, which is kind of funny. Um, she was, I was so like locked in on my mental work and I ended up, you know, I had a water birth, which is exactly what I envisioned. And I ended up delivering her myself, like pulling her out of my own body in the water. And it was just like, what is happening? Like it was just mind blowing, but I couldn't have done it without her. So even though she wasn't like, and I have been in very physical doula labor supports and I've also been in very hands-off ones. So just as a side note there, but anyway, um, once I realized that I was like, holy, holy crap, we've been duped. Like we have been duped. And then from there, it was just sort of this unraveling of, you know, hormone health and hormone dysregulation and healing, um, just like healing my body from the ground up with nutrition, with food, with mindfulness, with, I mean, the thing is when I think we throw around this word holistic a lot, right? We, we hear it all the time. It's like, what does that really mean? It just means that it's all connected. It is literally all connected. Women have been screwed. We've been gaslit. We've just, we're not heard. And I'm not trying to like come at everybody with a pitchfork, but it's like when we deserve to feel well, we deserve to feel well. And quite frankly, I think that that is a, it's a birthright. It's a moral obligation. When we heal ourselves, we again are directly impacting the lives of those people in our circle, right? We are helping our kids have a healthier upbringing. We are having a better connection with our partners. We are having more meaningful, deep relationships. When you feel shitty, you can't show up. (laughs) You just can't. And so sometimes you do have to start with that low hanging fruit of like, take a vitamin or drink a shake or like whatever it is, it's going to like get you going in that right direction. And then as you are ready, I do believe the information comes, but here's the thing. People go to the doctor and they get this lab work back and it's all in a normal range. Like if there's one thing I can leave your audience with, it's this, you go and you get your lab work done, right? Because you know, something's wrong or it's just routine or whatever. And it comes back in a normal range. And I'm using air quotes as normal. Normal does not mean optimal. Those normal ranges oftentimes are coming from people that go to the doctor. Why do people go to the doctor? Because they're sick, right? So these optimal ranges are coming from people that are, or these, excuse me, these um, normal ranges are coming from people that are not in optimal health to begin with. And then under that, there are different categories of like, for example, right now I'm dealing with hypothyroidism. And if I didn't, do the actions that I'm doing right now and working with who I'm working with, I wouldn't have that diagnosis, right? And a diagnosis is important because it we need to get to the root cause of things. That's the other like piece of all of this is that you have to get to the root cause. You have to get to what's causing these things to happen in the first place. And so anyway, that's where like a holistic health coach comes in is that they can look at all parts of your life. They can help you make sense of lab work. They can look at your lifestyle, your stress levels. Like I said earlier, stress is a silent killer and um, just help you see the big picture. They're not invested in your prescriptions or your health insurance or anything like that. They are not a mental health professional looking at it through only one very specific lens of mental health, right? They're going to bring it all together. The whole, the whole person is one unit, one functioning unit. So that's why I'm in, in it. And I love it. I love the work that I get to do so much. It's like, 
It's so fulfilling. And because women feel empowered, right? Like we're, we're taking, we're reclaiming our health and our vitality. We're saying, oh, wait, I don't have to wait for somebody else to validate that I'm having these symptoms or to validate that this is a feeling I think I have going on. Because another thing is that a lot of, a lot of symptoms are common. And so because they're common, we think that they're normal, but they're not normal, right? So I think a lot of times you go to the doctor and you're like, oh, I'm fatigued. I'm tired. I'm, you know, this or that, but it's, it's normal because I'm like, I'm a mom with young kids or whatever. Like we dismiss it or they dismiss it. But no, you don't have to feel this way. We can get to the root cause of it and you can do it's several layers. It's not just one thing that's going to fix you. I am dying because this is all exactly my language and the thing that keeps coming up for us on this podcast as well. We keep meeting more and more people who are on the path of helping others identify root causes and advocate for themselves to be the ultimate optimal versions of themselves. And even in my personal work writing, we've last year, one of the first projects I worked on with one of my creative partners was rebranding my mom's functional medicine doctor. She does bioidentical hormones. She has been since I was in college when she started going crazy during menopause and was totally gaslit um, through that experience. But thankfully was very into Suzanne Summers, who is like a big person in this world of like natural healing and all sorts of stuff. So anyway, this is incredible information. We have to do a part two to dig in even more because I'm getting really like my heart is beating really fast because I'm so amped up about how much we all in little different ways are changing the world just by spreading this information and and helping people understand that they have options and that they can like I think for women too, we've been conditioned out of having boundaries, standing up for ourselves. We're just supposed to accept an answer. And for me, one of the big unlocks was when my dad was sick and had cancer and we were working through all these options for him. That's when I really learned about advocating. And we've been trained kind of as a culture not to advocate for ourselves. And that has been something that has been a mission of mine for a really long time and just like your own medical experience, your families, everybody, we have to advocate. And I love that you in your role, the way that I'm interpreting it is that you can create a bridge for people. Like they're not all like me where they're like, okay, I'm learning about this thing. And now I'm going to like spend 48 hours straight researching the shit out of it. And like learning about people, finding people, disseminating information. It's help. You're the one that can help them get on that path and really advocate for themselves and make the next right step for them where it doesn't feel overwhelming. It doesn't feel like, where do I even begin? Like it can begin with somebody like you who has, like you said, with the dual part, no stake in the game of whatever is going on with big anything in the hospital, in the world or whatever. And I mean, one of the things that I would love to dig into more, especially with your experience in schools is like how we feed our children and our, our nutritional education. But I'll leave that for another day because I get super fired up about that as well. I know that we are a little bit close to time. Do you have time for some quick, um, rapid fires? Try to make them quick. Yeah, I do. You've noticed that I'm not quick. (laughs) Number one, what are you proudest of in your business right now? I think I'm the most proud of my podcast right now because it is a space of growing connection and and empowerment. And the one thing I wanted to just really quickly touch on is that what you were alluding to with advocacy is the flip side of that is that we have too many people that are feeling very disempowered in their health or disempowered about their birth, or disempowered in life, right? And they they feel like their hands are tied, and they literally don't know what direction to go. And so I think that these spaces are so important for that. But for the podcast, I just, I love it because the feedback that I get, as I'm sure you can relate to, when you hear somebody that you, you shared something, and they respond back with their story, and you're just like, wow, like not only did you trust me enough to listen to this episode, but you trusted me enough to share your story with me. And I do not take that for granted. So I'm definitely, I think right now, the most proud of my podcast. 
Totally. And we've been really excited to bring this back. We had a couple month, couple months off and we feel more and more like, especially with who we've been talking to, just this bigger mission behind all the work that we're doing and helping to share this information. And I like, I particularly am feeling more of my feelings lately too, because that's something that I was trained out of, of like, nothing happens when you feel your feelings. So you might as well not have feelings. And I would cover that with anger if I was hurt or whatever. We are not going to go into my whole mental health (laughs) journey. But then I get all weepy because I'm like, this is going to change so many lives. Like I'm so weepy just about talking about advocating for your own health because it can really just make all the difference. So we appreciate you. That's my point. And your podcast. I can't wait to listen. Tell us about a book you read or a podcast you listened to recently that changed the way you're thinking about your life or your business. Is it okay if I just share a couple? Like really quickly, just some titles, throw some titles out there. Okay. So Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess, I have talked about on my podcast and I've shared a little bit. Life-changing, literally life-changing for anybody that has any mental mess. So AKA all of us. Um, And that is by Dr. Caroline Leaf. She's incredible. Her work is incredible. Follow her on Instagram. Um, same with Doing the Work um, by Dr. Nicole LaPera, the holistic psychologist. I mean, hello. <laughs> I just joined her um, um, her self-help healer circle. I'm yes. very excited about it. It's incredible. Mm-hmm. It's so amazing. Um, and anything by Robin Sharma, but I've been reading um, – oh, gosh, I'm blanking on the title now. Oh, the Everyday Hero Manifesto. Beautiful. Like beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. It translates to business. It translates to your life. Like it's just about – it's it, um, It's written very similarly to Glennon Doyle's books. If you guys are familiar with her, like Untamed, Carry On Warrior, that kind of style where it's like short stories, like short essays kind of. So you can read it in any order, which I love. Um I definitely identify as ADHD. So I'm like always reading like three books at a time that I kind of just circulate through. Um, Those books are incredible. The Model Health Show is an absolutely empowering podcast that I think every single person should listen to. Sean Stevenson, yes. Yes. Shout out to to Sean Stevenson. He is just an incredible human. Like literally one of the most compassionate, empathetic, so smart, so discerning. I've learned so much from him. Um, He has this beautiful way of holding people accountable, but with like radical love and understanding and like he come his story is absolutely incredible so if there is one podcast out there that i would love for people to listen to besides yours and mine of course is um the model health show um and then lastly i just want to throw this one out there too um oh gosh i wish i was thinking of the, the name of the book but rachel um gosh can i look her up really quick because i really wanted to share this title of this book for everybody um i had it just totally lost my my thought. But this book is about um, women entrepreneurs specifically or um, We Should All Be Millionaires. Oh, my God. Hello. We Should All Be Millionaires by Rachel Rogers. Everybody, if you are a woman and you are an entrepreneur, you need to read this book right now. Like it's it's crazy. It's it's life changing. So um, I would say those are those are my my go to's. And then just if anybody's in birth. Birthing from Within is an amazing book to read if you have any kind of birth trauma or you're planning an unmedicated natural birth. I have all of those pulled up. Thank you. What would your last meal be, especially now that you're no longer vegan, which I would love to talk to you more about as well. (laughs) These are such good questions. Ooh. I don't know. My husband made some burgers the other day that were pretty freaking bomb, so... Possibly could be a burger. Um, I, man, I think it would be a burger. It would probably be a burger. Burgers are a great choice. What is the best business purchase you've made in the last six months under $100? Oh, this is a tough one. Oh, actually, it's not that tough. I purchased this book. I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, Shalene Johnson. She has these journals called the Push Journal. And, um, at the time it's like a 90 day journal. Right. And at the time I really wanted, um, to get one, but they were all sold out. And so I was like, there's gotta be something else. I found this journal on Amazon. It's a 90 day journal and it's, 
It literally speaks to my soul. And it's helping me with consistency. And um, I can send it to you guys if you want to link it in your show notes or whatever. But it is a freaking game changer. It breaks your day down. It's like a planner. I don't know. That works for people like me with like a thousand different thoughts that happening at one time. So that would be like my absolute game changer that I bought for myself and my business. It's like 25 bucks or something. Yeah, that's awesome. Because... I'm looking for a new one too. Me too. I'm almost done with my planner that I've been using for multiple years and I'm like really stressed out about it. I have one that I got from TJ Maxx and then I'm like, I don't know if this new format works for me. So we'll see. Last question. What is lighting you up lately? What's lighting me up lately and always is the people that I get to interact with. Like, I, I don't think I highlighted this really well enough in our interview today in our chat today, but I have so much respect and deep admiration for the people that trust me to, to hold space for them and be a part of either their birth stories or just be a friend or be a client of mine. Like I have so much reverence for the people I get to serve. And I just don't think that's, I don't take that lightly at all. It lights me up when I get to have raw, honest, real conversations with people. And because of the work I do, I get to do that regularly. And so it's just, it's a massive gift that I worked really hard to get to. And I want to honor that too. Like the journey to get there and we have a huge, I'm going to speak for both of us, like a huge amount of admiration for your path. And especially like me looking from the outside of you and Emily meeting in high school and then having everything come to this moment is really, really powerful. And I can only imagine how much more good you're going to do in the world and how many lives you're going to touch. And we hope that we can be a little messenger for you as well. A little carrier owl like in Harry Potter. To all the people I love who need it. to know about you. Thank you. I love it. I love the work that I do. It's just, it really, it merges, like you were saying, get weepy. Like I literally just get so weepy when I hear these beautiful stories and that people, you know, like I said, to trust somebody enough to to hold that space. Like we need to take that more seriously, I think, totally. in our culture. Mm-hmm. So thank you for your kind words. And I agree. I feel the same about you guys. <laughs> Kinsey, thank you so, 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 so much for being here. Um, before we let you go, how do people find you? What are your handles? Tell us all the things. Yeah, all the good things. So my handle on Instagram is at a better knowing. My website is kinseyfields.com. And if you go to my website, you'll kind of see um, the coaching stuff, the doula stuff as well. Um, my Instagram, I think, is where I share a lot of my content. My podcast, obviously, um, anywhere you listen to podcasts, it's called A Better Knowing. And um, yeah, that's where you can find all my stuff. Thank you for being on here. And we're going to give you another awkward goodbye. Bye. See you later. Thank you so much, Kinsey. We Thank are obsessed. Thank you, guys. Thank you so, so, so much for letting me come on. This is such an honor, such a gift. Thank you. Yeah, and part two forthcoming. We're able to yeah. book people more easily now on the podcast. Okay. So that's part of our slowness. But, you know, we're giving ourselves grace in all of it, too. You know? Yeah. What is meant to be will be. And... Again, we appreciate you, and um, I think you have a lot more that we could dig deeper on, and and we're totally open to your ideas of what Absolutely. that could look like as well. So everybody, thank you for listening to this episode thank of you. The Coast, and make sure that you come back for episode two of Kinsey, for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. This episode edited by Kate Gentry Shue and music provided by Sloan Best.